It's six o'clock and I'd like to call the third regular meeting of the 2020-2021 Common Council to order. Would the clerk please read the quote for the day? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We do not learn from experience. We learn from reflecting on experience. Thank you very much. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, next is the approval of the minutes from our April 27th Common Council meeting. All the person Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to approve. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the minutes? Seeing none, would all those in favor please signify by saying aye. 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 Roll call. Motion passes. Uh, next, uh, our clerk is going to give the take the roll call. Alderperson Bourne? Here. <coughs> Donahue is here. Alderperson Feldy is here. Uh, Alderperson Ackley? Here. Alderperson Phillips? Here. Alderperson Decker is here. Alderperson Sorensen? Here. Alderperson Silvaglio? Here. Alderperson Wolf is here. Alderperson Mitchell? Here. There are 10 present. Thank you. Uh, next is mayor's appointments. Uh, those that, that will lie over till our next common council meeting. Is there any public forum? No one this evening. Okay. Uh, next, uh, our council vice president will make an announcement regarding the retirement of city administrator Hufflin and the process for hiring a successor. Alderperson Donahue. Uh, thanks, Mayor. And I'm going to tag team this with Vicki Schneider, our acting uh, uh, Director of Human Resources and Labor Relations. Um, as uh, Vice President of the Council, it has uh, uh, come to me to uh, facilitate the process of looking for our next city administrator. Um, what I'd like to do with Vicki's assistance is to run through for the Alders uh, what the process is that we contemplate in place right now. Um, first of all, um, we are going to uh, constitute a hiring committee. At this point, it will be Mike, Mayor Vandersteen, uh, me, and uh, uh, Alder Sorensen, uh, who is uh, chair of the Committee of the Whole. And of course, we will need the assistance of uh, Chuck Adams, our city attorney, and, and Vicki Schneider, our HR director. Um, we are in the process of updating the administrator profile and the job description. Uh, Daryl Hoffland has told us that the job description at this point from his perspective looks good um, and we may be making smaller additions but um, uh, we uh, hope to have that profile ready and out and in a, just in a second Vicki's going to talk about our plan to to distribute that uh, profile uh, and um, uh, information uh, so I've had the opportunity in the past uh, when an important leader in an organization leaves to look at, from an interim process, where the organization has been, where it is now, and where we look to go. Um, because our time frame is extremely short, we don't have uh, the opportunity for a lot of navel-gazing, as it were. Um, but uh, our intent at this point is to meet individually with uh, department heads uh, to uh, get their feedback on uh, what they're, now that the opportunity has presented itself, what they're looking for in terms of a city administrator, what's gone wrong, uh, what's gone right. I, I will suggest to you mostly everything has gone quite right, um, but uh, it's always good for an organization to reflect on how business is being done and think about better, if there are, ways of, of doing business. So we're going to be setting those uh, appointments up in the near future. Now, 
I'm springing this on alders, and depending on your response in terms of attendance, um, we are also looking at having a relatively brief, uh, but altogether closed session this Wednesday at 6 p.m. Uh, I'm gonna suggest a virtual meeting so that we don't imperil anybody more than we, we need to uh, coming in um, to ask those very same questions. What are you looking for in a city administrator? Uh, are there qualities that we should be focusing on and just to get input? Now, because we are kind of springing that on alders at the last minute here, again, because time is of the essence, um, I'm hoping we can pull that meeting off uh, and, uh, and have a good conversation. Chuck will be with us to make sure that we stay on closed session topics and don't wander into, into open session um, uh, concerns. But again, with that body of knowledge from the people who are very important to the functioning of the city, department heads, alders, of course everyone is important, but the leadership, I think, um, getting that information, getting feedback, getting people thinking about what it is they're, they're looking for will be really important. Um, the, um, the next step is to get that application out, is to, to get the information out and to do it as quickly as we can uh, reasonably do it. Um, Vicki has been through this a lot more than I, and I'm just gonna turn it over to you, Vicki, if you... Thank you. Um, working with uh, partners in the Human Resources Department um, to, again, review the job description, we are prepared to uh, post that tomorrow morning. Uh, we're looking at the various uh, job posting sites. We will do, typically, uh, we will use Indeed, which will funnel, all of these <coughs> should funnel into NeoGov, which is our way of collecting applicants. We are looking at, obviously, LinkedIn and our other social media out outlets, uh, WCMA, which is the Wisconsin uh, City and County Managers Association. We're looking at posting on the League of Wisconsin Municipalities, um, also on WAPELRA, which stands for Wisconsin Public Employer Labor Relations Association. We have relationships with these. Um, if there was anything that we would want to do um, nationally or in a broader scope. We also have the ICMA. We could look at international, the City Managers Association. It really is dependent on how far out we want to go as an organization, but we will get these out tomorrow morning on the, on the websites that I listed um, just now. Uh, the position we have reviewed, we will keep the position open until filled. We're looking at a first review date. If we have this open to candidates by tomorrow as the first review date would be May 26th. Um, the pay grade is going to be in the range as it states per the conversations I've had with uh, you, Mary Lynn, so that we can uh, get this posted, but knowing that that is also open for negotiation. Very good, thank you. Um, the, uh, that May, uh, May 26th date is aggressive, but again, our timeline needs to be extremely aggressive, and we think we can do it. Um, back in 2016, we mailed a lot of um, position descriptions, a, a nice brochure, making you really want to come to Sheboygan and so forth. We think that we can save money uh, by uh, using um, uh, electronic resources, and of course I think, Vicki, correct me if I'm wrong, that has become sort of the normal way of doing business uh, as opposed to mailing things out and posting in newspapers and paying money for things, is that, that correct? That is true. Some of these job sites may have uh, fees attached to them as well, depending on what we're looking for and looking at how broadly we want to put this out. Um, we do have a process in place to update the document that was used in 2016, so that's, that's being worked on, and we can do a mailing if we feel that is necessary. Very good, very good. Um, we think that this position will be attractive. Um, in the past four years, I think it's fair to say that we have professionalized our city government structure and performance. Um, we uh, have a, an adequate 
balance sheet, I would say, and, and I think that we will be uh, an attractive position. Of course, doing this in the time of COVID is uh, going to be a, a substantial challenge, but we're gonna just plow forward. Once those, uh, hopefully, um, uh, uh, applications have been received, um, we're uh, going to uh, form up to uh, interview our uh, uh, choices. Um, the precise structure of the interview process and so forth um, hasn't really been determined, uh, but I think that we will um, uh, that we will hopefully have good candidates to interview and and be able to present someone to you, um, so that a July 1st starting date is realistic. And um, as my mom used to say, God willing and the creeks don't rise, uh, you know, things should be, we should be well on our way. So we're happy to answer any questions, but again, just to emphasize that this is the beginning part of a process and the, the mechanical parts I think are in good, are in good place, but uh, uh, away we go. Thank you very much. I appreciate the information. Any questions? Next, we'll move on to mayor's announcements. Um, first of all, I just want to talk a little bit about our garbage carts. Today, the city started uh, their, their garbage uh, collection with the new garbage carts. I want to say thanks to all of our residents for trying to find new places to, uh, to put those carts in their yard and their garages. Uh, I know that took a little bit of a challenge, but hopefully everybody's going to find this is a much better way to conduct our, our garbage collection. Um, the uh, Mead Public Library has made some changes based on Governor Evers uh, new order, and they are now offering uh, curbside pickup of materials. They ask for you first to request a book online or give them a call or a another library material then to wait for a confirmation from them to tell you that your order is ready. Then after that, please call them to schedule your pickup time and then uh, stop at that time at the Mead front uh, uh, main entrance so that uh, they can uh, get that to you. Uh, the Frisbee uh, Disc Golf Course at Valrath Park was open this last Friday. So it's good to have two courses uh, handling the uh, interest in playing that sport. Um, as part of the CARES Act, uh, the city received extra community development block grant funds and last meeting council approved a $400,000 job retention forgivable micro loan fund. Uh, this uh, fund is going to be focused on small businesses from one to five employees that have not been able to access other needed federal assistance and loans between $3,000 and $15,000 will be awarded, and we expect that we should be able to help uh, between 28 and 30 businesses with loans. On Friday, May 8th, there's going to be a, a live stream of uh, the Sheboygan County Strong uh, Facebook live concert. This is going to be a concert on Facebook. It's uh, co-sponsored by the Sheboygan uh, Area United Way and the Sheboygan County Chamber of Commerce, and it'll feature a local band called BBMC, and it'll be live streamed from the Limelight Pub, so I hope you can take that in. And uh, due to coronavirus concerns, the uh, city of Sheboygan has canceled the 4th of July parade and the Freedom Fest entertainment at Deland Park and also the Venetian Boat Parade. A final decision will be made on the festival fireworks uh, on June 1st, so stay tuned for that. And remember to stay safer at home, uh, wear your mask in public, try to keep a six foot distance and keep gatherings to 10 people or less. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to the consent agenda. That'll include items 2.2 .2 through 2.6. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a, make a motion. <coughs> motion to receive and file all our O's, receive all our C's, and adopt all resolutions and ordinances. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the consent agenda? <coughs> Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll?
10 ayes. Motion passes. Next, we'll move on to resolutions. Item 4.1 is resolution number 10 of 2021. May Alderperson Sorensen and Decker authorize an expenditure of funds received as part of the Criminal Justice Law Enforcement Drug Trafficking Response uh, Grants Solicitation. Alderperson Sorensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to suspend the rules and adopt the resolution. Is there any objection to suspension? Seeing none, then we have a motion on the floor to adopt the rules and the resolution. Second. And we have a second. second. Under discussion, is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll for passage? <clears throat> Ten eyes. Motion passes. Item 4.2 is resolution number 11 of 2021 by Alderperson Wolf and Donahue to retain the provider relief fund deposit made to the city of Sheboygan by the Department of Health and Human Services regarding COVID-19. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to make a motion to suspend the rules. Is, is there any objection to suspension? Seeing none, please proceed. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to make a motion to adopt the resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. That motion's on the floor. Is there any discussion? Uh, Mayor, I have a question. Go Mayor ahead, Jim. Go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I noticed when I was reading this over that the amount is $26,931.57. And I also looked over the document and how we've got to comply with this, uh, all, of the, uh, all of the hoops that we have to go through. Uh, my question is, who, who uh, of our team is going to uh, have the task of complying with this? And uh, boy, I'll tell you, it really looks very burdensome for $26,000. Uh, I'll ask um, our finance director, Marty Halverson, to respond. Thank you, Mayor. Um, older person born, it's a good question that you bring up. Uh, it is something that uh, myself and Thomas Cameron, our assistant city attorney, had been uh, discussing the pros and cons of these dollars versus other dollars that are available for relief. Uh, the benefit of these dollars is they were sent immediately, so we, we have them already, which um, based on feedback from other finance directors that I heard in a, a webinar I was on, as well as uh, other city officials. We've found that in the past, sometimes the FEMA money can take months and possibly up to years to receive. So the 26,000 now is, is a, a big plus. Tracking it, we believe because it's not a large dollar amount, we already have expended almost $6,000 worth of ambulance uh, PPE equipment, and we have worked with Assistant Chief uh, Chuck Butler to uh, identify other future expenditures related to PPE equipment, as well as a possible additional fit testing uh, apparatus, which uh, certainly can be beneficial. Right now, we only have one of those, and the N95 testing then is not being done as quickly as it could. So we don't believe that there will be a <clears throat> difficulty in trying to allocate or track just up to $26,000. And these dollars are 100% the cities then as well, which in most of the other funding uh, agreements, you're, it, it's usually a cost share of some, somewhere around 25-75 or 50-50 or 90-10. Or but this is 100% ours and the dollar value we believe we can spend and track easily. Thanks for that information. Is there any other follow-up, Alderperson Boren? No, that's fine, thank you. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? <clears throat> 10 eyes. Motion passes. Item 4.3 is resolution number 12 of 2021 by all the persons Wolf and Donahue authorizing, retaining outside legal counsel to represent the city regarding claim 
24-19 from Axley Burleson, LLP, on behalf of Audrey Brubaker, including any litigation related thereto and authorizing payment of said services. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to uh, suspend the rules. Is there any objection to suspension? Seeing none, please proceed. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to make a motion to uh, adopt the resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the motion? Uh, Mayor, this is Alderman Jim Bourne. Again, I have a question on this one also. Please proceed. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Attorney Adams, uh, when I read over when I read this over yesterday, it didn't really give an, uh, a description of what this case is about. Uh, so I'm wondering if you could just tell us what this case pertains to. And then also, I'm also wondering if uh, we should consider putting a cap on these fees. Do you have any idea of what this is going to cost to defend? Thank you. City Attorney, can you so respond? This is, yes, this is the uh, case uh, involving the uh, garbage truck uh, and the collision with the child on the bicycle. Uh, so uh, that's that's where that is. As far as uh, a cap on costs, I, I did not include that on this. Um, this is this is a defense case. We have to defend it uh, in in any case. Um, you know, and, and we do have experience. This attorney has uh, uh, done this work before uh, for us in these sensitive kinds of uh, cases, including. Uh, the situation with a student from Tower Academy, uh, and uh, his fees also are uh, included then uh, as part of uh, the uh, the insurance coverage that we have. I mean, we have a significant amount we'll, we're going to have to pay up front, but if it gets beyond that, we do have insurance coverage for it. Any follow up, older person, born? Well, I'm I'm just wondering, uh, Attorney Adams. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, I hate to go into something that's open-ended and I realize the importance of the case. Is there, is there a way that you could uh, maybe give us a progress report as this, as this proceeds with how much it's costing us? I, I can do that. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? <clears throat> Ten eyes. Motion passes. Item 4.4 is resolution number 13 of 2021 by all the persons Wolf and Sorensen, <coughs> extending the deadline for payment of assessments to benefited properties against which assessments were proposed for the parking assessment districts one, two, four, and five. Alder person Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to make a motion to suspend the rules. Is there any objection to suspension? Seeing none, please proceed. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to make an, a motion to adopt the resolution. Second. Thank, thanks for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the motion? Um, Chad Pelichek. I just want to state that the purpose for this resolution is we've heard from a number of business owners in these parking assessment districts, and albeit that the assessments are higher because of the costs incurred in those districts. Um, a number of the business owners have said that it's gonna be hard because they haven't had any cash flow um, to pay that by June 1st. So the discussion came up as to could we extend it out and as long as we can get paid before the end of the year and, ca and categorize it in this year's uh, revenue accounts, it seemed like it would be all right. So that's where the September 1st date came from to allow these businesses to get back operational and hopefully get some cash flow in order to make these payments. Thank you for those comments. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? <clears throat> Ten eyes. Motion passes. Next is item 4.5, resolution number 14 of 2021 by Alder Persons Wolf and Donahue, authorizing an extension of the deadline for the payment of quarterly room tax payments. Alder Person Wolf. 
Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to make a motion to suspend the rules. Is there any objection to suspension? Seeing none, please proceed. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion uh, to adopt the resolution. Okay. Thank you for that motion in support. Is there any discussion on the motion? Uh, Mayor, I have a question on this one, please. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, this would be a question for Chad. Uh, Chad, with these uh, uh, hotels, motels, that uh, those type of establishments with the room tax, are they required to put those uh, room tax dollars in a separate account and then just pay us every quarter? Or do you know if they go into just general revenue and then at the end of the quarter they give us a... Uh, they write us a check. I'm just wondering whether there has to be a, a separation of those room tax dollars from their general revenue. To speak about what the um, hoteliers do and how they do it, I'm not sure they file a report with the department, with the finance department over what their revenues are and then they have time to pay that. So how they do it on their end, I'm not quite sure. It gets paid to the finance department and then the finance department collects it. 70% gets turned over to the Sheboygan Room Tax Commission who then turns it over to visit Sheboygan and 30% stays for the city. But how they handle it in each of the establishments, I'm not quite sure. If I could just, if I could just follow up, and, and, and I certainly sympathize with the lodging facilities that we have around Sheboygan, but the room tax is collected for the people that are staying there, regardless how many people are staying there. So I, I would imagine they've already collected the money and if, if they already have that money and, it's, and they're supposed to set it aside for room tax, I don't understand actually why they can't pay it. To answer that question, I think it really comes down to a cash flow issue. Uh, the fact that they shut down in the middle, a number of them shut down in the middle of March and still paid some employees and those types of expenses. Um, we're not talking about a lot of requests here. I think uh, we've gotten payment from the majority of them except for two hotel establishments and one of them, which is the larger one, plans to pay before the uh, May 31st deadline. So this is really a cash flow issue of getting operational again on their end and having some cash to pay it because I think they probably used the cash that they collected to offset other expenses during the start of COVID. Thank you. I wasn't aware that we had some that actually closed down. I understand now. Thank you. Is there any other so discussion? I, I guess, Mr. Mayor, this is Ryan. I, just a follow, kind of relative follow-up question for that. Um, so are, are, so some of the hotels that have closed down, are they still required to pay some portion of, of the room tax, Chad? Well, the ones that closed down wouldn't have any people staying in their rooms, so they wouldn't be collecting any revenues to pay that. So the, the, the few that have closed down, with the largest one being Blue Harbor, um, you know, I think the revenues are, the delay in the revenues is really just a cash flow uh, side of their, you know, their performa that they're just asking for a couple week delay because Blue, in the case of Blue Harbor, they've closed down for a month and a half. But, you know, to say, do they have the funding? If, if they had nobody staying there, nobody would have paid the tax. Is there any other discussion? Oh, um, Finance Director Marty Harrelson. Uh, Alder Bourne, one other uh, item that we have heard that could play a factor in this is during the COVID uh, pandemic, some of the staff have, you know, sometimes that are responsible for the accounting methods and or um, processing the, the reconciliation of all of the, the transactions might not be in the office as timely as well. So it, it might not always come down to cash flow. I think that is probably some instances, but there could also be a staffing issue for them to file a accurate and complete return and, and make the payment to us. So it, it's really hard to pinpoint exactly all of those, but we're certainly going to follow up. We do. We did receive several um, payments right on the last day, which is traditionally what most of them do. Um, so we're not overly concerned that there's a abuse uh, taking place here. Thank you for those comments. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll?
Ten eyes. Motion passes. Item 4.6 is resolution number 15 of 2021 by Alderpersons Wolf and Donahue authorizing the appropriate city officials to execute an intergovernmental agreement for law enforcement services for the 2020 Democratic National Convention in Milwaukee, Wisconsin between the city of Milwaukee and the city of Sheboygan. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to suspend the rules. Is there any objection to suspension? Seeing none, please proceed. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to adopt the resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion in support. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Ten eyes. Motion passes. Item 4.7 through 4.11 will be referred to various committees. Uh, under reports of committees, item 5.1 is RC number 4 of 2021 by the Finance and Personnel Committee, to whom was referred resolution number 4 of 2021 by all the persons Donahue and Bourne, authorizing the appropriate city officials to execute two engagement letters with Quarles and Brady LLP to serve as bond counsel for the city of Sheboygan. Alderperson Donahue. I move that we uh, authorize. Sorry, there we go. I move that we uh, authorize appropriate city officials to execute two engagement letters with Quarles and Brady to serve as bond counsel for the city. Second, Warren. Thank you for that motion in support. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Nice. Motion passes. Item 5.2 is RC number 5 of 2021 by the Finance and Personnel Committee, to whom is referred resolution number 5 of 2021 by all the persons Donahue and Bourne, authorizing the issuance and establishment, establishing parameters for the sale of not to exceed $4,985,000 in general obligation promissory note series 2020A. All the person Donahue. Thank you, Mayor. I would move to uh, authorize the issuance and establishment of parameters for the sale of the bonds referred to. Is there a second? Second, Warren. And I apologize, I meant promissory notes, not bonds. <clears throat> Thank you. We have a motion on the floor. Is there any discussion? Mayor, I would also um, move to amend the resolution that's on the floor uh, to provide that. Uh, <clears throat> The resolution will incorporate the exhibits provided by the Wisconsin Public Finance Professionals based on bids received today, and two, to add the language shown in the red line prepared by Quarles and Brady, reflecting the fact that the bids are within the parameters of the resolution. Is there a second? Second, Warren. Very good. The amendment's on the floor. Is there any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of the amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Amendment passes. And then uh, we're voting on the uh, motion as amended. Is there any discussion on the motion as amended? Seeing no discussion, will the clerk please call the roll for passage? <clears throat> Ten eyes. Motion passes. Item 5.3 is RC number 6 of 2021 by the Finance and Personnel Committee, to whom was reserved, re referred resolution number 6 of 2021 by Alderpersons Donahue and Bourne, authorizing the issuance and sale of $3,100,000 in taxable water utility revenue bond anticipation note series 2020B. Alderperson Donahue. Thank you. I so move. <clears throat> Second, Warren. Thank you for that motion and support. That motion is on the floor. Is there any further discussion? Mayor, I would move to amend the resolution on the floor to provide, uh, rather to, number one, incorporate the exhibits provided by the Wisconsin Public Finance Professionals based on the bids received today, and two, 
to revise the language as shown in the red line prepared by Quarles and Brady, increasing clarity, adding detail about the debt service reserve, slightly modifying the covenants, and appointing Associated Trust Company as the registrar and paying agent for the notes. Is there a second? second. <laughs> Very good. We have a, uh, an amendment and a second. Is there any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none. All those in favor of the amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Amendment passes. Now we're going back to the uh, general motion as amended. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, will the clerk please call the roll for passage? Ten eyes. Motion passes. Under general ordinances, uh, items 6.1 and 6.2 we referred to the Public Works Committee. Under other matters authorized by law, I'll turn it over to City Attorney Charles Adams. 7.1 is an RO by the City Clerk submitting various license applications for the period ending June 30, 2021. That'll be referred to the Licensing Hearings and Public Safety Committee. 7.2 is an RO by the City Clerk submitting various license applications for the period ending June 30, 2021 and June 30, 2022. That'll also be referred to the Licensing Hearings and Public Safety Committee. Uh, next, we'll be conducting an alder person orientation. We have a separate agenda for that. Um, to start out, the uh, first item will be how business is transacted, commonly used documents, the referral process, types of actions in the council, and common parliamentary procedures. Uh, Meredith, do you want to start out? Um, I think Chuck was going to um, go through the commonly okay. common council handbook. City attorney, yeah. please proceed. Yes, yeah, so... Um, in the uh, attachments uh, on board docs, there is uh, a copy of the Common Council Handbook, which is the, uh, uh, the rules uh, or many of the rules uh, for council, at least the rules that are not contained in uh, ordinance or in statute. Um, many of you are familiar with, with a lot of these things, so I'm, I'm going to be fairly brief in, in, in my review. Uh, but just as a reminder, uh, there are some documents that are official council documents that, that we deal with, ordinances, which are the laws of the city, resolutions uh, through which uh, the city generally or the common council generally conducts its general business. Uh, ordinances and resolutions typically uh, do uh, require uh, a vote uh, of the common council. It, it typically, the item will come to the council uh, for a first reading. It will get referred to a committee and then it will uh, come back. Uh, ordinances uh, are required to go through that process. Resolutions, there is a, a provision uh, for um, having them just have a single reading. Uh, there are also reports, uh, reports of committees, RCs, and reports of officers, ROs. Uh, these uh, documents are reports or recommendations that have either been uh, submitted by a committee uh, or submitted, in the case of an RO, submitted by a department head, a board, or a commissioner. Uh, and they generally contain recommendations and, uh, and reports on items. And typically, you are merely receiving those reports uh, and uh, perhaps adopting the recommendations in those. And again, those are things that you would vote on. The RCs typically come directly out of the committee. Uh, they're a result of committee action. ROs uh, can either go uh, to a committee and come out, or they may, in certain situations, also come to council for a first reading, get referred, and, and come back out. Communications are sort of exactly what they are. They're communications whether it's letters, uh, whether it's other documents, 
uh, that are received by the mayor or by you or, or by the city clerk that end up being submitted to the common <coughs> council for consideration and placed on the agenda. Now, not every communication that actually gets received by uh, uh, the mayor or by the clerk or even by you uh, automatically gets put on the agenda. In fact, typically the process is those items are first uh, uh, directed to staff members. Uh, oftentimes, staff members can deal with those requests very quickly and there's not necessarily a need for common council action on those things. Uh, but sometimes uh, the mayor will determine uh, in consultation with the city clerk to place certain items on, on an agenda. Or it may come into a committee and the committee chair also uh, in consultation with the clerk and, and the department head involved uh, may make the decision to place that on an agenda. Communications typically though, uh, you know, you're just receiving the communications uh, and then filing those things. Uh, they're more for your information. Uh, it may cause you to decide to take some other action, uh, including having an ordinance or a resolution drafted, uh, but the communications themselves typically are not actionable items. There are other items or other documents that often uh, you will uh, see, uh, often attached uh, in, in board docs. Uh, those other documents are really for information only. They're not, they're not for action. Uh, they're often very important information. They often uh, help you decide on how to, how to act on a resolution or, or an ordinance that, that's coming through. Uh, and so the fact that they are not an actionable document doesn't mean that they're not important, uh, but they are not documents that you're going to vote on. Most common of those documents is the IFC. Uh, IFC is an item for consideration. Uh, I often tell people that, that the alternative uh, is that it also stands for information for committee because that's what it is. It's information that's being provided to you in a standardized form uh, so that you have the information that you need uh, related to an item that is up for consideration. Uh, it typically comes in at, at the uh, council level, although you'll often see, or at the uh, committee level, although you'll often see those items uh, on the council agenda as well. Uh, there are some rules about uh, timing. Uh, <coughs> most of those rules really are more applicable uh, to uh, uh, department heads and, and staff because they're the ones trying to get these uh, items onto agendas for you, uh, but it's useful. You, you have those rules as well that's hopefully useful for you as well in sort of planning out items that you may want to get onto a council agenda. And the mayor does control uh, the council agenda. He's the one who decides uh, what goes on the agenda and what doesn't. Uh, there are some uh, procedural rules uh, if you disagree uh, with the mayor's uh, decisions on what gets put on an agenda and what does not, although we have not had those kinds of issues really in, in, in recent years. Uh, most common types of action then on these types of documents, passage, which is favorable action, uh, referral, which would be sending the uh, item uh, to a committee or to a commission or to a board, uh, filing, uh, which just simply um, is what it is. It's, it's dispensing of the document uh, or getting it out of committee if, if the committee is filing it or lying over. Uh, and the reason why things sometimes lie over is there are requirements for certain types of uh, matters to have two readings in front of the Common Council. Uh, and so when something lies over, it's often doing that so that you can have the first reading and then it lies over to another meeting uh, for the second reading and, and final act. You do have the opportunity in, in certain cases to suspend the rules. Uh, the rules typically do require a first and second reading, uh, although that first reading can sometimes occur at the, at the committee level. Uh, as on, on occasion, hopefully not that often, although we had about five or six of them today, um, uh, on occasion you will need to suspend the rules and suspending the rules most commonly happens when there's a need for quick action. Uh, and uh, basically there is a motion as it's happened uh, tonight uh, to suspend the rules and then the mayor simply looks for an objection. Uh, if there is an objection to suspending the rules, um, there, there would be a vote uh, and uh, you do have to have a supermajority in order to suspend the rules. Uh, but in most cases, uh, we typically um, 
instructed uh, uh, department heads and, and others to include in any document where the rules are being suspended uh, the basis for suspending the rule so that you have that information uh, when you look at the document. Uh, I'm not going to go through every single piece of information here. There's, there is some inf interesting information for you on uh, certain types of motions and whether they require a second and whether they're debatable and whether they're amendable and what kind of vote is required. Um, uh, you can also ask me those questions when, when they come up and I will answer them as quickly as I possibly can uh, 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 at, at the time. There are a number of other common rules. Again, I'm not going to go through all of them. Some of them we're pretty good at following others. You know, I'm like the rule that all the person shall speak only twice on matters being debated or discussed during a common council meeting. I don't know how much we've enforced that one in recent years, but to some extent we haven't enforced it because it hasn't been a problem. Uh, but it is a rule that's out there and, and, and you can be uh, aware of that. There are some also rules about who has the privilege of the floor. Um, some of you who have been around a few years know that we did uh, recently um, uh, make some changes uh, to that to give a few more people uh, uh, the privilege of the floor uh, sort of automatically rather than uh, requiring a vote uh, by you. Uh, starting at page eight, uh, we talk a little bit about commissions, committees, and, and boards. And, and the rules there are fairly similar. Uh, obviously, committees are typically uh, where a lot of the real discussion occurs, where a lot of the um, work happens, uh, a lot more of the details get sort of worked out there. Uh, but And committees also tend to be a little bit more informal. They don't have to be. Um, that, that's really kind of depending on what's on the agenda and what the chair decides uh, to do. Uh, but uh, in, in general, um, you know, committees work in a similar fashion. They're just a, a smaller subgroup uh, of the common council and then commissions and boards are appointed uh, by the council uh, or, or appointed by the mayor and uh, approved by uh, the council. Uh, there are some things just to, uh, you know, to remember, there does need to be a quorum present. Uh, quorum uh, is a majority. Uh, remote attendance is allowed in the same way that we allow them uh, here at the common council. Uh, we did uh, update our, our um, remote attendance rules to allow uh, people to attend remotely and count towards the forum, which is why we can do what we're uh, doing here today. Um, the most important thing I would say about, uh, about the issue with uh, remote attendance is we do have a provision that says that while you can attend and vote remotely, the one thing you have to be careful about is if you're voting on something that requires you to inspect a document or, uh, or to you know, listen to some kind of testimony and, and see the, the documents, there has to be provision for doing that. Otherwise, you can't uh, vote on it. To some extent, we allow you to make that determination uh, for yourself and say, yeah, I was able to see it or I wasn't. It was going to be interesting, actually, at the LHPS committee uh, meeting on Wednesday. We did have a hearing, uh, and had that hearing gone to to the end, uh, we would have had a little bit of work in front of us with a large number of documents, uh, basically getting them up to the screen and sharing them so that people could see what were in those documents. Uh, and that would have been interesting. We were prepared and, and ready to go, and as it turned out, we didn't need to do that in that particular matter. Uh, beyond that, uh, I think I've, I've covered uh, most of the items related to you. There are some rules uh, for the public, uh, starting at page 10, uh, things like the, the public forum and, and some of the basic rules for that, and I can cover that if you have uh, any uh, kinds of uh, questions on that. But uh, typically, you know, the public forum rules are, uh, they're, they're set by you, and, and currently you allow, uh, you know, up to five people speak to speak for a limited amount of time. And there are rules as to who gets chosen. It's first come, first serve, but with preference for uh, city residents. Uh, so a city resident who comes in after a non-city resident would, would be able to bump that city resident if there were um, too many people on, on the public forum that day. Can answer any questions that you might have about that, uh, about any of the items on in the Common Council handbook. 
I see no questions. Did you have anything? Okay, then we'll move on to the uh, the next item, which is reviewing an agenda. Mary Lynn, did you want to start, or Chuck, did you want to continue? Go ahead. I didn't have anything in particular on that. Go ahead. I don't either. <laughs> okay. It's pretty straightforward. Um, if you are a chair of a committee, uh, having input uh, or carefully reviewing an agenda before the meeting is really helpful. Uh, board docs has kind of revolutionized how we do business. And so uh, those concerns of past days of getting information and so forth are uh, not, uh, uh, they're just not an issue anymore. Um, the one thing I would note is just to see how the agenda item is configured. Sometimes it's for discussion only. <coughs> Sometimes it is for discussion and action. <coughs> and that affects how we're gonna deal with something. Um, but uh, I'm a firm believer in actually looking at the agenda before the meeting. Um, reviewing each and every item is probably not necessary, but for, um, I mean, you certainly can. Uh, it's a good idea if you can, um, but uh, Items that are bound to generate discussion, you really should take a close look at. <coughs> Sorry, and as um, Chuck pointed out, um, the IFC, uh, which was Daryl's uh, innovation when he first came, is an extremely helpful document to figure out what's going on, and then at the bottom, what action is being requested. And so again, it takes the guesswork out of your role as a committee member or as a um, as a council member. I think that's about all I would have, Mike. Very good, thank you. Then um, we'll move on to um, general rules of conduct. Um, you know, they're pretty simple that, um, you know, proper dress, using the microphone properly. Uh, we've all gotten used to the new technology here in the council chambers, and I think everybody's getting used to operating at home on, uh, on these uh, remote broadcasts and uh, web webinars, so it's good to see that. Um, then we can move on to open records and open meetings primer, Chuck. Thank you. So I did provide an outline on each of these items for you. Um, it's similar to an outline I, I've, I've spoken before uh, to the council on these issues, and uh, if you were around for those, uh, you've seen this before. Uh, open records, uh, I'm gonna talk about first of all. And the purpose of the open records law is basically to ensure transparency in government. In some places they're called government in the sunshine law. Um, and, and also to assist the public uh, to be informed uh, when they're making decisions on, on who to elect and, and how to vote on things. I've listed there um, many of the legal requirements uh, from chapter or from yeah, chapter 19.32 of the Wisconsin statutes, uh, who, what is a record, who is an authority, uh, who, is, who is a requester. Some important things to note uh, is, first of all, we, we talk about who is the custodian of a record. And uh, here at the city, uh, typically, uh, we have said that uh, you are the custodian of your records that you've received. So if, if someone is emailing you documents about official city business, uh, you are the custodian of your records and you need to make sure that you're uh, keeping those. And uh, if there is a request for them, uh, you will need to provide them. Now, some typically requesters may not be coming directly to you for those requests. They may be coming to a department head or to the city clerk or to, or to my office uh, making a request. And in those cases, we will be in touch with you uh, if there are items that you're that we believe you're the custodian of or you're likely to have uh, that you you may need to turn over to us. One of the th reasons that that's fairly important is uh, we do encourage you, and as you know, to, to use uh, uh, city email. Um, that certainly makes uh, makes things much easier for us to find things when when there are documents being sent. We don't have to ask you to dig through your personal email or 
you know, have to dig through your personal email uh, if you're uh, if you're consistently using your city email uh, for uh, city business. I'm not going to get into every single uh, uh, issue on on open records. Uh, there are a number of items that are exceptions. There is an analysis that that we use. Uh, basically, first of all, we look: is this a record uh, that that is you know that does need to be turned over? Not everything is a record. Uh, second, uh, once we we know that a request is for a record, we determine is this a record that there is an exemption for in the public records law that says, oh, you you can't turn this over uh, for some reason, like patient healthcare records. Uh, once we've eliminated that, and now we know it's a record that's subject to be uh, turned over, in most cases it is going to be turned over, but we do have the opportunity to engage in what's called the balance. <clears throat> Uh, where we balance uh, sort of the, uh, um, the interest of the public in the openness of such a record uh, with any policies that would weigh against revealing that record. And so on occasions, using the, uh, the balancing test, we do uh, uh, deny uh, sending out a particular document. Uh, sometimes it's documents that are, are particularly sensitive for, for good policy uh, reasons. So for example, when we go into closed session, um, we are going into closed session and I'll, I'll get a little bit into that in, in, the, in the next section uh, on open meetings, but we have very specific reasons why we're going into closed session. We'll use those uh, policies, you know, if there's a document that was talked about in closed session, we'll use that uh, and, and uh, apply the balancing test using sort of those uh, uh, provisions of the open meetings law. And in that case, we might uh, deny sending out a particular document. So what happens if you disobey the open uh, records law? Well, um, the, the requester can file an action uh, in circuit court and, uh, or, and get an order for you to release the records. And uh, if they are successful in that, uh, they can be awarded attorney's fees and costs. Uh, and in cases where you are the actual uh, uh, keeper of the record, where you, where you are the custodian of the record, that can be put personally against you, which is, again, why we very much encourage you uh, to use your city email, to use city resources, basically, for city business, because that makes things much more easy for you uh, in, in taking care of those things. Uh, there are a couple of uh, scenarios on there about what a, what is a record that's, that's subject to, re to release, uh, and, and we use these also with, with employees as well. Is it a record that needs to be released if, if it's an email to your spouse talking about dinner plans tonight? And the answer to that is no. It's not related to city business. It's a personal uh, email, and that's not subject uh, to uh, uh, open records. What about, though, an email using the email to your spouse stating how much you hate your job and how much you hate your department head. Well, that might actually be something that would be uh, releasable. And uh, uh, having uh, gone through uh, open records and gone through email accounts, uh, it, it is sometimes a little surprising how sometimes people use their uh, city email uh, addresses. So uh, as, as for you, just you know, be careful how you use your, your email address. Knowing that your city email is, is likely open to, to, for people to, to look at in, in, in many cases. How about a text? Um, let's see, say a text to your fellow council person inviting the council member and his or her spouse for dinner next Friday. Well, that's, that's personal, um, just like uh, the email uh, to your spice, uh, spouse talking about dinner plans tonight. That, that's not going to have to be released. But the fact that it's a text as opposed to an email doesn't necessarily make a difference because if you are using text messaging for official city business, that may be a record and you will need to, to save those uh, records. And that's something that, you know, with text, that's very important to consider uh, because texts are not as easily savable uh, always as, uh, as email. So uh, uh, a scenario where perhaps you're sending a text during a council meeting to your fellow council person, encouraging them to ignore the city attorney's advice about an upcoming agenda item. 
that is potentially a record. And if, if somebody uh, made a request for uh, any documents, uh, you know, between alders talking about a particular issue, that might end up uh, having to be released. A Facebook status up to, uh, uh, on your Facebook page uh, stating your support of a candidate running for common council. Uh, if it's on your own page and it's really not about council business, it's probably uh, not a record that needs to be released. Obviously, it's fairly public and people are going to be able to see it. But now let's say you use the city's Facebook page uh, to do that. That certainly is a record. It's also a policy violation uh, for somebody to do that. So that's something to be considered. So uh, another set of uh, questions. Let's say somebody, uh, you know, a member of the public walks up to you in the grocery store. You're, you're up at Piggly Wiggly and, and they come to you, six feet from you, and, and start telling you about all the corruption in government and, and how they're going to prove it. And then they verbally say, and by the way, I want you to provide all these particular documents so that I can prove all this corruption that's going on uh, at City Hall. Is this a request? And the answer to that it is it is. Uh, records requests are not required to be in writing. They can be oral. They can be verbal. Um, there are some some somewhat different rules as far as timing and things like that for uh, oral requests. But it is a request. Second, does the person have a right to ask for these documents? And absolutely, they do. They have every right to ask for documents unless they're about, you know, unless they're trying to prove there's some sort of corruption about, you know, patient records or something like that. There may, there may be some issues there. But typically, if what they're saying is that I, I'm trying to get information about how city government runs certain things because I think there's corruption, it doesn't matter whether you agree with them or, or it doesn't matter whether they're nice about the request. It uh, doesn't matter if they're even particularly rational about the request. They have a right to make that request. Uh, and, and so then the question becomes, do you have to provide the person copy? And here we just get to the, the, the issue of, well, who is the custodian of those records? If they're asking for your individual email records, you may be the custodian and you would likely have to uh, provide those, although the city can certainly help you with those. And I would say anytime you receive a records request, it's probably a good idea to let my office know uh, and let the city clerk's office know uh, so that we can assist you with that request. In many cases, though, it may be that the request is for documents that, for which you are not the custodian. And what I would say in those situations is you can certainly say, I'm sorry, I don't have those records. I'm not the custodian of those records, but it is entirely appropriate then to direct them to who might be. Uh, so if they're asking for, you know, for example, documents related to finances of the city, it, it might be uh, Marty. If it's, uh, you know, things having to do with economic development, it might be Chad or the fire department, it might be Monty. Uh, or, or you may just want to direct them to my office uh, and to the city clerk's office as well if you're not sure uh, about uh, who might be uh, the custodian of the record. We, will, we, we often do assist with, uh, with a lot of those things. Before I move on uh, to uh, open meetings, uh, are there any questions about open record? Uh, I have a question. I have a question, Mayor. Go ahead. Uh, Chuck, uh, when we leave office, uh, how long does the city keep our records and how long would our records be subject to an open, uh, uh, you know, our records request? So it depends on what the record is. So we actually have a records retention schedule. It's a fairly in-depth record with a, lot, a, a document with lots of different deadlines for, for various different things. What I would say is that when you leave office, it's probably a good thing to contact my office or the city clerk's office about how you're going to comply uh, with those records. In, in many cases, uh, you can turn those documents over to us and we're going to be able uh, to help you with those things. But you do have some requirements under the records retention schedule, to keep items for a period of time based on that schedule. And, and it really depends on what the document is, what the record is, as to what the time frame is. But I can certainly help you with that 
um, you know, in 25 years when you decide not to run for council again. Okay. Uh, my, but uh, just be a little, I'm a little more specific is uh, all of my records are on the, are on, on my city account. Uh, does the city routinely then keep those for a certain number of years, just a blanket that they keep them or, uh, you know, assuming that everything that I have is on my city account? Yes. So we do, and we and we follow the the records retention requirements of the records retention schedule. So the IT department does keep those items. So if you've got electronic records, emails, things like that, that is all kept pursuant to the uh, retention schedule. I had one other question. I I don't know if this is the place that you want to cover this, Chuck, but. Just give us a reminder on walking quorums and also sending out group emails to all of our fellow alders when we should do that and when we shouldn't do that. Tell you what, how about I cover that uh, in the open meeting section because that's really the, what that is. Very good. Any other questions on open records before I go to open meetings? Please go ahead. Not hearing any, I'm just gonna to move to open meetings. So you also have an outline on, on open meetings. Uh, and a lot of uh, the purpose behind the open meetings laws is very similar to open records, to allow public access to information, government in the sunshine. Um, and, and really, um, I think it's fair to say that the open meetings law is designed to limit the use of closed session. Uh, closed sessions, are uh, generally are, are supposed to be very much the exception. And anytime we go into a closed session, uh, there needs to be very specific reasons for why we are going into closed session. And there are rules that we have to follow uh, in doing that. What, uh, in talking about legal requirements, what bodies are required to follow the open meetings laws? And obviously the common council is and the committees are, but really uh, all sorts of, uh, governing bodies for special purpose units of government, uh, study and advisory committees, commissions and boards, uh, any subunits that have been created. So, uh, you know, years ago we had, a, um, we had created a, a subcommittee to look at uh, the vicious dog and dangerous dog requirements. And that, you know, all those discussions had to be in open and follow all the uh, open meetings laws as well and quasi-governmental corporations as well. Any, any sort of uh, uh, corporation that's been set up uh, by, uh, whether it's by municipalities such as the RDA um, uh, or any, any uh, corporation that sort of acts in a quasi-governmental uh, way. A lot of times um, economic development uh, uh, corporations uh, have been required to uh, uh, be uh, to follow open uh, meetings laws as well because they're seen as, as uh, taking on quasi-governmental um, roles. Uh, as far as uh, some of the things to consider, there is a numbers test and there is a purpose test. So uh, if a half or more of the members are present, uh, there is a presumption that there is a meeting. Um, now, that's a presumption that can be rebutted. And so, you know, for example, let's say six of you um, show up for the 4th of July fireworks on Labor Day uh, and you happen to all sit near each other. Is that a public meeting? Well, no, um, it, not necessarily. And if all you're talking about is how great the fireworks are and, 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 and how uh, the sponsor has outdone themselves this year, you know, that, that's fine. Now let's say you start getting into city business and, you know, as part of this, you start, you know, saying, hey, you know, um, Chad, the economic development coordinator was part of this. Maybe we ought to give him a raise for doing such a good job with, 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 uh, with doing this. Well, suddenly now you're getting into city business and, um, and you do need to be very careful of that. And potentially you have met now the numbers test and the purpose test you're dealing with city business. A walking quorum, Alderman Boren uh, mentioned that. Uh, you can't get around the, uh, the public meetings law by just simply going from alderman to alderman to alderman to alderman. If, if you sort of do this chain where everybody talks to each other about what they're going to do, um, you have now created this walking quorum where in essence, you've tried to walk around uh, the quorum rules and, and that is impermissible as well. 
And so email chains, phone conferences can very much uh, be uh, in violation uh, of the numbers test. Um, so you have an email uh, that goes to all. If, if, you know, if six or more of the alders are on it, there is a presumption that is a meeting. Now, it also has to meet the purpose test. So for example, let's say uh, Alderman X sends out an email to the rest of the aldermen and says, hey, I think we should vote this way on this item. Uh, that's clearly problematic. And that, that uh, is potentially a, a meeting. And I think any alderman uh, that receives an email like that should you know, not respond in, in any way uh, and probably let somebody know whether it's the to the administrator or my office or the clerk's office know uh, that, that we've got this issue. But there are some exceptions uh, to that purpose test. So for example, uh, let's say you're, you just are trying to set up a, a meeting date. That is actually an exception on, under the purpose test. If you, we're just trying to figure out when we can meet that is, that is permissible. Or, you know, you're talking about something that's not really city business. Uh, hey, let's, let's all get together, you know, um, let's, let's all get together for uh, pizza in, in Alderman Wolf's backyard or, you know, things like that. Those are also, uh, those are going to be permissible because even though they, they don't pass the numbers test, they pass the purpose test. Uh, the purpose isn't, uh, this, uh, you know, doing city business. So when you look at it, I, I have on, on page one and, and page two, I have some, some, some of the uh, language regarding what's, what is the purpose test, what's the purpose uh, for the gathering. I think in general, you can use some common sense in, in, in thinking about that. Um, and, and, you know, if you have questions about a particular issue, you can, you can always call my office as well. There are some notice requirements for meetings, uh, and if you don't follow those notice requirements, then you potentially have an open meeting violation. Uh, some, some of those relate to timing as to how, how much beforehand we have to post uh, the meeting. Oh, the agenda and what's on the agenda, um, uh, that, that also there are, there are requirements as to what we're, we have to be rather specific about what is on the agenda. We can't just have, say, an agenda that says, oh, we're gonna have a meeting on such and such a date to conduct the business of the city. That would be inappropriate. You have to be much more specific about uh, what you're talking about. And we do have posting rules. Uh, we do post these uh, in certain physical locations as well as, as sending them out. Uh, and, and there are a number, and publishing them as well. And, and there are rules that the clerk's office is very aware of uh, that they follow on, on those things. Closed sessions then, uh, I've listed there uh, uh, a number of those uh, reasons, section 19.85 of the statutes list, the various reasons that we can go into closed session. And, and you know, anyone, any one of you who's ever been chairman of a, a committee or, uh, or, or president of council knows that you kind of do that tongue twister where you're reading all the reasons why that you have to go into closed session. We have to do that. That is, that is one of the requirements, and you have to very specifically indicate what is the purpose for going into closed session. Because, you know, it, it, that is also a part of the open meeting. You need to let the public know uh, what, it, what it, is it that you're talking about in closed session, and why is it that it is a closed session, that, that you're not entitled to be a part of that. So I've, I've listed uh, there uh, those reasons from the statute. Uh, typically, uh, you will always um, convene a meeting in open session. You'll announce the purpose for the closed session and the statutory reason, and then you'll have a majority, you have to have a majority vote via a roll call vote to go into closed session. In closed session, you're limited to only the items that have been announced on the agenda for the closed session. And then you only reconvene in open session if it's included in the public notice that you're going to reconvene in open session. If you don't have that, you can't come back uh, into open session and start acting on things. Uh, you have to have that in the agenda that you're going to be uh, coming back. In general, votes on items uh, are, must be done in open session. The exception to that is where vote, the vote would compromise the need a closed session. So occasionally, as, as you know, we'll have a closed session and we will conduct a vote in closed session 
uh, to basically get the sense of, let, let's say we went into close session to confer with uh, legal counsel for the city on how to proceed on a, on a legal matter, uh, you know, that we're negotiating, let's say. Well, you might vote to say, uh, you know, uh, Adams, you should offer up to this amount or uh, up to this amount. Well, we don't want that to be in uh, in open session, that vote, so that, that kind of a vote is permissible in closed session. Uh, we do have to preserve the record of the closed session, so the clerk's office does uh, take uh, minutes of closed sessions as well, but of course those aren't going out on board docs uh, because they are closed sessions. But it is important to note that when the reason for the closed session has you know, gone away, uh, people may be able to get those records of what happened in closed session after the fact. So let's say you, you're, you're meeting in closed session to talk about, you know, how, how I should settle this particular lawsuit. Um, once that lawsuit is settled and, and the case is done, somebody could request that record and, and find out what was it that, uh, that you actually authorized me to do. And, you know, did, did, uh, um, did, did we get a good deal? You know, you authorized me to pay, you know, $10 million and I was able to negotiate down at $8 million or something like that. That is able to be found out. Uh, Penalties. Uh, a court can void decisions that are made at illegal uh, meetings, um, and if they decide that the public interest in enforcing the open meeting law outweighs the public interest in sustaining that decision, uh, there are fines, forfeitures that can be um, uh, levied against you, and, and again, you have personal liability. So what I would suggest is this. If you believe that uh, there is a violation of open meetings law taking place. Let's say you're in a closed session and, and you feel like things have just gone so far uh, and we're not talking about items that were uh, on the closed session anymore and, and, and that, that lawyer isn't reining people in like, like, like uh, he should be, um, you may want to just step out and not participate any further uh, to avoid um, you know, the potential personal liability in that circumstance, that that's that would be uh, not only perfectly fine, but it's probably the the, the best thing that you could do. Uh, among the penalties, also is potentially the payment of attorney's fees uh, to someone who is impacted by this. So I also listed a few scenarios there on open meetings. You're at the Fourth of July festivities on Labor Day down at the lakefront. You see a few members of the committee that you chair for the five members gather and talk about their children and the weather. <coughs> Is that a violation? Well, no, your children uh, and the weather, you know, they're, that's not city business, uh, unless your child happens to be like a department head that you're trying to fire or something. Um, but uh, that, that would typically not be a violation. But now one of the four people starts to talk about some of the items on the next agenda. Is that a violation? Yeah, that's, that's potentially a violation. The four of you shouldn't be talking about, because you've got a majority of a committee there, uh, you shouldn't be talking about items that are on uh, that agenda. Now let's say two of the five members uh, walk over to some <coughs> picnic tables out of earshot and they start to talk about this. Is that a violation? And the answer to that is no, that would not necessarily be a violation. You're now down to, to two people uh, and typically you would not be in violation. Now, there is one thing to consider, which is a, a, a reverse quorum. Uh, and there are certain items where a supermajority vote is required. And because two people on a committee uh, could potentially, although at committee we don't have, there are very few committees that have um, supermajority requirement. But, you know, let, let, let's just say it's one of those things. It's uh, two members of the, uh, um, uh, of the parks board decide to talk about whether to, um, you know, to let a, a, a park become not a park anymore, because that does take a super majority and because two people could uh, prevent the vote on that, there you could have a violation uh, because of the reverse quorum rules. Or let's say um, something that requires a two thirds vote at council and you have four members uh, of the council talking about that item, even though you're less than five, that, that's potentially a violation. So you should, you should also be aware of what are those items that typically do take a uh, super um, majority. 
Another question is an email chain includes the entire council and members are discussing substantive items at that meeting. And if it is about substantive items, yes, that, that, that could be. But if you're, for example, only discussion setting a date for the next meeting, you know, that's, that's perfectly okay. That is allowed, that is not a, a violation. Finally, you know, your committee meets fairly regularly and, and a lot of times people who are coming in, in front of the committee, um, you know, regularly request to go into closed session because they're embarrassed about the content of the discussion. Uh, and but the content of the discussion is readily available to the public through other means. Uh, should your committee consider going into closed session? Well, you know, typically in those situations, if it's readily available anyway, um, there's probably a reason for that, which is it's, it's not considered a reason to go into a closed session under the rules in 19.85. Now, if there is a basis to go into closed session, you can do that. There are even provisions for going into closed session. Uh, without uh, it being on the agenda, although you need to be very careful about that. And once you go into closed session for an item uh, on an agenda that did not have a closed session item, uh, you're not going to be able to come back into open session because of that rule that I talked about before, where there always has to be uh, on the agenda a, a, a motion to come back into open session uh, if you're going to come back into open session. So that's something to be very careful about. It rarely happens. Uh, but there can be circumstances in which um, suddenly something comes up that requires a closed session uh, and you, you, you could finish the meeting in, in closed session uh, at that time. Are there any questions or comments about uh, any of the items there? Chuck, I'd like to ask you one question. You talked briefly about committees saying that uh, if you talk to another person on your committee and it's just the two of you, that would be okay, except for the negative reverse quorum. But if, uh, if you talk to uh, three members of that committee, then that would, uh, would be a, a problem because that's now then, um, that would be the majority of the committee. But what if you were on, say, the uh, Public Works Committee and you're interested in something in finance uh, and you talk to three members of the finance committee lobbying them, uh, is that a walking quorum because you're not on the committee? So here, what I would say is that is not in and of itself a walking quorum because you're not on the committee. However, uh, the, the problem that you have is if you now are sort of acting as the stalking horse, you know, you, you, you know you, you're sort of being the person to make sure that that all three people are now going to vote the same way on the committee, that that is potentially a, a problem. So what I would say is you need to be very careful about that. Uh, the other issue that you would have in that circumstance is now you've got one who's not on the committee, but they are on the common council. And that person being on the common council is likely to have to vote on the item coming out of uh, the, the committee. Uh, and so you also have to think that second step ahead. And now are you running into potential um, violations there for an item that may come out of committee and now you are going to vote for it, uh, vote on it. And now you have four people and uh, depending on what the item is that you could have a reverse quorum there. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, then we'll move on to constituent interactions. Uh, I'd just like to start out a little bit with that one and saying that um, when you encounter somebody in the public and, you know, maybe it's not convenient, I always carry some of my business cards around, and all of you have those now too, and I'll just give them to that person and say, look, this isn't the right time to talk about this. I really want to pay some attention and understand your issue. Please shoot me an email or, or give me a call during business hours or at a certain time and, and try to delay that. But um, Sometimes that's a better way to, uh, to work through that. And then when you get an email or a call from somebody, uh, always try to get back to them right away that day if you can, and at least let them know you received their communication and uh, give them an idea of the time you're gonna need maybe to get an answer if you can't give them that answer right away. And then uh, the other thing that I think many of us do is you know we'll go back to our department heads, ask them about it, 
Um, and they're usually pretty good at giving you the explanation, but if you don't feel you can relate that that well, um, ask that department head to, uh, or that employee, other employee to, uh, to maybe call that person back. They've been very good about handling some of those things as well. So just a few hints that, that I've had. Uh, Todd or Mary Lynn, anything you'd like to add? Um, if I could just follow up, I, I think that, you know, we talked about this last year uh, when we had some uh, <clears throat> new folks, but one of the uh, most uh, satisfying and uh, sometimes challenging um, activity as, a, as an alder is problem solving. And this is essentially what constituent service is. How do you solve the problem? And I found early on in my um, tenure as an alder that uh, department heads and staff uh, in the city are almost uniformly extremely helpful. And uh, that is the place, you know, for you to start. Um, and people are grateful. You rarely get a thank you, like, gee, thanks for solving my issue. But when you know that you've solved it, it, uh, uh, it is gratifying. So, and just following up on what Mike said, the worst thing you can do is not answer. Um, I know a lot of us are getting uh, group emails um, addressed to everybody. Um, and sometimes there are issues that really can't be solved uh, as an alder. Uh, but if you think that you want to be the person to try to figure out um, uh, what's going on, it doesn't hurt to say, I've got this one or I'll cover it uh, and uh, we'll all be grateful for that. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good way to approach those, those kind of group email issues. So, but uh, it's just important to get back. Anyone else? Okay, then we'll move on into uh, city operations. The next uh, item is fiscal impacts due to the COVID-19 on city revenue and expenditure impacts of the CARES Act and supplemental allocations to Sheboygan. Daryl, you're gonna take that one. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, included in your packet is a spreadsheet uh, in contacting and working with uh, management team members uh, to identify material or significant changes that are anticipated during this fiscal year. Uh, these are the responses I received. Uh, please note that uh, when department heads initially responded back, they asked, are you looking for worst case scenario? Are you looking for just year to date uh, impacts? And in, in almost every case, my response was, uh, please assume sort of a moderate uh, situation that uh, by the end of May, beginning of June, things are starting to come back uh, as far as activity level, but maybe not fully up to strength uh, throughout the course of the summer months. So again, this is more of a moderate uh, attempt to identify changes in revenue as well as expenditures. I'm going to quickly go through sort of the, some of the categories. Again, if they're a number without bracket, that typically means uh, additional, that's a fiscal positive. If there's a bracket, whether it's in the revenue column or in the expense column, that's, it's, a, it's in essence a negative. Uh, so in the police department or police operations, there is an additional uh, funding uh, source that we've received, for a little over 47,000. But then again, the bracket, there are some decreases associated with revenue, whether it be parking violations, court penalty fines, or, or just general donations or contributions. Parks and forestry, uh, as many of you know, park sh shelter rentals, uh, we actually refunded uh, all those through the end of May. Uh, correspondingly, there is going to be a drop in seasonal staff, so that is netting out to no cost. Garbage, uh, Mr. Beeble has identified that with, uh, with folks being home, whether that means they're getting a lot more card uh, boxes shipped to them or they're eating out less, uh, the tonnage is up. Uh, and so there is a tipping fee, additional tipping fee associated with that. So this is approximately three months of additional tipping fees. Miscellaneous revenue, uh, Marty Hoverson identified roughly 51, 52,000 in lower interest income. And then uh, with uh, the police department um, and the number of stops or tickets issued, 
Uh, the estimate from our municipal uh, court judge is that we will see, again, under a moderate situation, roughly $50,000 drop. Uh, again, it's uh, revenue in the municipal court, but ultimately it comes into the general fund other f under a category called other financing sources. In the area of elections, from the city clerk received information about additional costs associated with the spring election, off supplies postage, um, and then and printing, other miscellaneous uh, licensing, and uh, just general revenue. Again, we, we will see a decrease, um, as an example, bartenders, uh, the number of licenses. Uh, we're seeing a decrease during this time because a lot of these establishments are not open. Uh, I've attempted, uh, again, to kind of categorize. These are all items in the general fund. And I put sort of a collective number together of 167929 Debt service fund, um, as many of you know, uh, a major revenue source or funding source in our debt service fund is monies that are being paid through room tax. Uh, in light of, and we heard a little bit about it uh, earlier as part of the uh, council agenda, uh, some of the hotels are closed. Um, overnight lodging overall is down. Uh, so again, under a moderate uh, scenario, uh, almost a quarter of a million dollar drop. And again, we keep, uh, of the 8% in room tax, we keep 30%, 70% goes to visit Sheboygan. Uh, so their impact is even greater. Transit utility fund, um, uh, Derek Mink has identified a significant uh, grant uh, as part of the, CARE, the Federal CARES Act, uh, almost $3.5 million. Uh, we're able to use that to offset uh, any reduction in fares. As you know, during the current uh, situation, we are no longer asking anyone riding the bus uh, or uh, asking for the bus to come to their house if it's paratransit, no charges. Uh, people are not purchasing passes, monthly passes. Also, advertisement on the side of buses um, that is down. Uh, capital expense, uh, as part of the stimulus package at the federal level, their goal is to get money spent into the economy. So uh, uh, Derek has been looking at op opportunities or options as far as how to spend uh, that grant money. Uh, as, as some of you are part of the Capital Improvement Commission, and you've heard uh, uh, that we are there is a recommendation that we move purchases in 2022, 23, and 24, move them up into 2021 uh, fiscal year in the form of buses, additional vans, and uh, building renovations. Uh, again, the expectation of the federal government is that substantial amount of this, these funds are put into the economy and, and spent. So far, we have roughly 767,000 of unidentified uses of those funds. Uh, again, we're unclear. At, we're still receiving information from state and federal government, federal government as to uh, how all these funds can be used. Uh, and as a result, uh, at this point, we have not identified 100% use of that CARES Act funding. On the back of the second page, again, is another CARES Act funding source, 539,000, almost 540,000. With the uh, 420,000 of the grant program, uh, that was created uh, two weeks ago, uh, plus public service allocation increase, and then administering these programs, 100% uh, uh, of these funds uh, are expected uh, to be spent. Library funds, uh, at Mead Public Library, again, uh, a decrease, uh, not significant, but a decrease capital projects fund. Uh, in discussing with my counterpart at uh, Sheboygan County, uh, they do expect a drop in sales tax. Um, as you're aware, there's a portion of that sales tax that is allocated to local governments to be used solely for the purposes of funding street or transportation related projects. Um, I think a 20% reduction in what we were originally allocated uh, comes out to be $82,200. Uh, last is a wastewater utility fund. Um, overall flowage or volume uh, has decreased. Um, there is, of course, a fixed portion to every bill, including residential, but overall volume, including uh, uh, manufacturing related. As an example, uh, NEMAC is our number one customer in the community uh, by far. 
Uh, if, when you go by some of their locations, uh, there's uh, limited number of cars in the parking lot, so their volume is, is down. One thing that I didn't put on here is uh, parking utility. Uh, good news is we did not have a, uh, a year, uh, late winter, uh, early spring with a lot of snow, so they're seeing a decrease in some of the expenses. Uh, Derek Mink has uh, temporarily put on hold some uh, parking lot improvement and maintenance projects. Uh, we are seeing a decrease in parking meter usage as well as monthly parking passes uh, or permits. Uh, so that's something that uh, was left off inadvertently, but uh, I wanted to share it with you uh, nevertheless. Any, any comments? Again, we have rough over $100 million worth of, of activity uh, in our, our city overall. Uh, this list, uh, I'm pleased that it's really only a page and a half as far as a, a moderate, you know, moderately being impacted uh, by the pandemic. Um, in the general fund itself, of course, we have a contingency for unique situations. This is clearly one of those occasions, and I'm pleased that we do have such a high fund balance uh, in that account. Uh, I know that uh, when uh, I meet with the management team on a weekly basis, we do talk about whether there's opportunities for decreases in expenses. Uh, and so that's something that uh, staff will continue to discuss probably over the whole course uh, of this calendar year. Any questions? I have a question, Alderman Jim Boren. Yes, Jim. Uh, Daryl, in your, in your initial uh, uh, budget discussion for 2021, a uh, couple things, if you're not taking a look at, uh, one, thing I, uh, one thing I would like you to take a look at, uh, and now that we have a new, are gonna have a new HR, an HR director is also looking at more of a cafeteria plan for city employees as far as their health insurance uh, just to give you an example, uh, maybe some of our younger employees uh, would, would rather have a, a $5,000 deductible and be able to lower their monthly premiums. Uh, just as an example uh, of coming up with something for more of our employees where it would be a win-win a for the city and the employee. The win for the city would possibly being, you know, our share of the premium wouldn't be as great. And also for the employee, if they were willing to accept a higher deductible for people in an age group that that may, might make sense for. for. Also, uh, in your initial discussions, I know the last three or four or five years, we've, we've had a 2% increase in wages for our city employees. Uh, in your initial discussions, is that the intent for 2021 or haven't you really discussed that yet? Uh, great, great questions, uh, comments, appreciate it. Uh, I'll start on the latter comment first. Uh, as far as potential wage increases for 2021, uh, as you're aware, uh, four, three out of our four contracts have been signed for calendar year. Uh, let me back up. Uh, two, two police have been signed. Uh, there is pending approval by the trans, amalgamated transit union for a three-year con. I think a three-year contract starting this uh, 2020. All those three contracts are all two percent or more. Uh, the existing fire department uh, contract, which we will commence negotiations this summer, uh, with an effective date of 1/1/2021, uh, that's in essence open for consideration. Um, uh, Prior to uh, the pandemic, uh, I was anticipating in light of the two signed contracts with the police uh, officers uh, unions that uh, a minimum, that 2% in essence would probably be the percentage. Uh, when, uh, as part of our budgetary process, there is a presentation at the Finance and Personnel Committee of anticipated uh, parameters or new information, new costs or additional revenue uh, and that typically is presented the latter part of May, beginning of June. Uh, I have been asked by members of the uh, Finance and Personnel Committee to, to possibly move that up as soon as possible. So uh, as early earlier today, uh, discussion, I had discussions with our uh, new HR director and labor relations director uh, about uh, a 
coming up with the costs associated with a couple different scenarios. Uh, so we will present some options and give you a sense as far as the total fiscal impact of, of 2% versus some, of, some other options. Uh, regarding health insurance, uh, as you're aware, uh, during your tenure as an older person, uh, older born, uh, the city went from a traditional health insurance plan to a high deductible plan for the very reasons that you just stated. Uh, what we found is not only from internal input, uh, but also from sort of industry-wide, uh, a lot of companies are going back to the traditional lower deductible health insurance plan. Again, as part of a employee retention effort, uh, employees, uh, and again, depending whether they're sort of higher uh, paid uh, employees versus lower paid, sometimes it's very difficult, especially for families, to pay for that higher deductible health insurance plan. So we're actually looking at the opposite. We're actually looking at coming up with a second option, but going back to a, a traditional lower deductible, lower being um, 750 single, 1500 family. Uh, again, as an option, uh, again, uh, I hope to show to members of the Finance and Personnel Committee that this new option won't necessarily mean more expense for the city as a whole, uh, but ultimately, based upon the <coughs> needs, financial needs of, the, of a family, as an example of one of our employees, it may be a preferred uh, route to go in that they, in essence, pre-plan and they can guarantee what their maximum out-of-pocket will be as opposed to the high deductible. It often uh, is a little bit of a guesswork as far as what the impact may be in any given year on them and their, their family's budget. I hope those, uh, my comments answer your questions. Yeah, that was very helpful. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, thank you, Daryl. Next, we'll call on Marty Halverson for a debt management policy session. Thank you, Mayor and older persons. Hopefully, uh, what I can go through with you, you, you uh, gain a little bit of insight into it just as much as uh, I have. I know I'm uh, learning this as well. Um, while I have our IT director putting a document up, I'll take this moment just to uh, thank Meredith as it is Professional Municipal Clerks Week this week. So she does an excellent job and is always multitasking and doing everything behind the scenes. <clears throat> Um, as the mayor said, I'm going to be talking about a debt management policy, and uh, you would have earlier uh, in your packet gotten a attachment of a Word document of a uh, debt management policy that the city currently has. Uh, one of the things that myself, as well as two other uh, individuals with the city, did go earlier to CIVMIC and when we were down at CIVMIC for our insurance, it was a policy update. And what I'm doing is, as you'll see on the screen, um, I'm, I'm taking the current documents and placing them or trying to put them into a new uh, consistent layout and format. So that's, that's one of the tasks that I've taken on as a uh, finance uh, goal of getting this not only to review and um, readdress all of our policies, but we're going to try to put them into a consistent layout so that they're easier to read, easier to follow, and hopefully um, informative in when they're updated, revised, and, and so forth. Um, right now, the, the one on the screen I just have up there is just a revision date, just purely just so that I had some information in there. There's no necessarily a date on when we will have it officially revised, but I want to bring multiple uh, at a time. So. Just going through then the debt management policy, certainly you can feel free to uh, follow along on your own version if you're wanting. I'm gonna touch on some of the, the key aspects of that and then I also have a PowerPoint to go through some uh, other items as to showing you a kind of a current where we are in relation to the city debt. Um, primary objectives of our debt management policy is to establish the appropriate use of debt, uh, find alternative methods, uh, to pay for debt service other than property tax, minimize the city's debt service and issuance costs, kind of leveling it out. That's one of the main things that uh, Daryl and I have been working with Carol Worth from Wisconsin Finance Professionals with. Um, retaining the highest practical credit rating. 
Um, that sometimes can be within our control in some aspects and other aspects not always. Um, you've got Sheboygan's average income is one of the areas where we tend to be downgraded on. Um, there's, there's things such as the economic uh, trends and or property values that can certainly affect that. Um, the types of industries and what we do have a factor on our credit rating. Uh, provide complete financial reporting and disclosure and maintain level and affordable annual debt service payments. Uh, policy guidelines. One of the meetings that we had right before uh, the finance meeting this evening was our capital improvements program. Uh, that's a program where it's a five-year capital improvements program. Uh, really what it is is a one-year budget and a five-year long-term capital plan. Um, a lot of the components of that is to make sure that we are uh, using our, our debt to provide for capital asset purchases um, and then maintaining some um, adequate uh, annual principal and interest requirements. Uh, another policy guideline would be uses of debt and other forms of borrowing. So like I said, it's acquisition. It can also be maintenance, replacement, or expansion of capital assets and infrastructure, but the city will not issue long-term debt to fund current operations. Um, debt capacities, um, certainly using the debt capacity to be used only after other financing options have been uh, reviewed. Um, and then the length of debt and timing of bond issues. Uh, one of the things that we've been uh, discussing over the last couple of years is whether we've got notes and bonds, and we have some of, some of both, and I'll, I'll show you later on where we currently are at with the total dollar value. But uh, generally, the city issues promissory notes with a 10-year amortization um, for capital improvement projects. Um, call features can sometimes be included in those uh, bonds. And one of the things that we did do last year was we did uh, call some of our financing for various reasons, whether it be to put, uh, take advantage of lower interest rates and or to level out some of our debt service. Uh, capitalized interest, the city will generally not capitalize interest on its general fixed assets and infrastructure assets. Um, there's also conduit financing, and that's debt issued by the city of Sheboygan to finance a project of a <clears throat> non-city third party. So the city may sponsor conduit financing um, that generally have a, a public purpose, um, but are not consistent um, and are consistent with the city's overall goals. Uh, credit rating, as I mentioned earlier, the various factors that go into it and what Carol Worth had uh, alluded to earlier this evening was we did maintain a double A2 rating. Um, one of the things that uh, we had last year, and I haven't had a chance to study the scorecard fully yet this year, um, we can fall into different quadrants and or boundaries on our credit rating. We actually are, last year we were fairly close to, uh, and actually I think our score put us below a double A2, but Moody's does have the right to upgrade you, and they, they did put us into a double A2. As I study some of the, the metrics and, and the scorecard a little bit further this year, I'll be able to understand how close really are we to that borderline. But you know, the, the challenge is trying to figure out the gray area that Moody's has at their discretion on, on um, how, to, how to score you and, and give your official rating. Uh, financial disclosure is another general uh, policy guideline. Uh, so is the uh, debt limits, which the city will maintain uh, outstanding debt in the amount not exceeding 60% of the city's aggregate statutory borrowing limit prescribed, prescribed by state statute 67.03, subsection 1A. Um, and then there's also independence method and award of sale as a policy guideline. Uh, refunding practices, as I said, you know, we did do some refunding last year and we're gonna uh, plan to potentially take advantage of refunding this year. And again, that could be for, for lower interest rates. And then there's also arbitrage as a uh, policy guideline. So with that, what I will do is have Meredith hopefully call up the PowerPoint. Give that a second to load. 
And what I'm going to uh, go through in the PowerPoint this evening is just kind of some current uh, position of, of where we are in the city within our debt and kind of relate it to what the policy had. So uh, if you want to go to the first slide. So currently uh, our 1231-2019 debt detail, we did have uh, on record our geo bonded debt and geo long-term notes. Again, those notes are the shorter term than the, the bonds. Um, and then we also have it split into different categories of geo debt and, and TIF or TID debt. Um, and there's the totals. And right now we're structured at about a 60% bond, 40% long-term notes. Um, that might be something that we look to whether, you know, how we have that balanced or if we have parameters put into the policy. I mean, we, we certainly don't want to restrict ourselves in any way, shape, or form, but it might be something that we'll, we'll take into account on how, clear, how much clarity we need in the policy. Next slide. And then we have uh, another slide that shows all of our geo debt and TIF debt annual princ principal and interest maturities. So individually, each over the next five years, you can see what our principal and interest and total are um, for all of our debt payments. Um, I do note down at the bottom though, the, these do exclude our TID NAN, which is $10.49 million related to TID 18. Uh, and it also excludes our, our sewer utility uh, clean water fund loan, which is at $8.8 .8 million. Um, but then there's also the, it, it shows how far out our debt is currently structured and that's out to 2038. And our grand total then of, of principal and interest of the just under $60 million. Next slide. Next, we have our debt service levy trends. Over the last uh, four years, we've got our debt service levy uh, trending upward. Certainly, we've done a fair amount of expansion and um, development in the city and uh, certainly replacing some equipment. I know we saw in our capital improvements, we've got capital equipment as well that uh, certainly we're looking to find a way to, to balance um, not only our, our debt service levy trend, but our, our annual service payments and still be able to provide all of the uh, necessary infrastructure and assets that are needed for the city. Next slide. Our legal debt margin uh, calculation based on 1231-2019. This is a document that you'll also always find in our, our budget book. So it gives, it starts out with the equalized value, property values of the city and the statutory limit percentage uh, to give you a general obligation debt limit. And then our total outstanding GO, less amounts available for financing, gives you a net outstanding GO debt applicable. And at this point, um, we are at 26.35% of our legal debt used. And that was as of 1231.19. And then the last slide that I have tonight is the net debt ratio, which shows our direct debt, which is the total debt, that $49 million that I had at the beginning, uh, divided by the equalized value. And uh, 1.68142 uh, is a, a fairly reasonable and, and healthy uh, value. Moody's, you know, at times looks at 3 to 4% being uh, on average. So I, I think we're in actually pretty good shape in that respect. So certainly I didn't get too deep into the weeds on the debt management policy, but um, I guess if, I, if there are any questions, I certainly can entertain them now. Any questions for Marty? Thanks for your presentation, Marty. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to personnel policies for elected officials. And our HR director, Vicki Schneider. Thank you, Mayor. It's my understanding that you have each received at some point a handbook for uh, uh, employee policies and uh, I'll be honest, it is uh, from 2016, and so it is in due need for a review. But it does serve to provide us with guidelines that are consistent and fair in decision making. And as it stands, uh, I just want to go and touch a few of the points that are noted in the handbook. Um, there is a concealed carry notation in the handbook so that uh, no employee is to enter any city facilities with a weapon unless they are um, 
duly sworn to be able to do so. Uh, safety is a primary uh, experience for all of us. We want to protect the, the integrity and safety of all our employees and those who are guests and visitors in our, in our buildings. Um, again, we have a zero tolerance for workplace violence. So if there's any threat or any kind of intimidation in that, in that sense, that, that would not be tolerated and could lead up into dismissal. Um, also, there is a note on alcohol and controlled substances, again, a zero tolerance for, for any employee being under the influence while, in, uh, while serving their responsibilities. One, one policy that I would like to particularly make note of is our harassment policy um, that has been created earlier this year, and we are uh, will be doing trainings on this as, as this uh, year unfolds, um, as we can do that for all employees. Uh, the, po the purpose of this policy is to maintain a healthy work environment in which all individuals are treated with respect and dignity, um, and to provide a process so they can report or investigate and resolve complaints of harassment. Um, Harassment can fall into several several areas. In particular, the policy calls out sexual harassment, which is defined as unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favors, and other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature uh, when these are explicitly or impl implicitly a term of condition of employment, are used as the basis for employment decisions or um, with the purpose of creating an intimidating, hostile, or offensive working environment. Again, harassment of any sort is not uh, tolerated, whether that's in verbal, written, visual, or physical acts that creates an intimidating or offensive work environment or interferes with someone's ability to perform their job. Um, the second part of a harassment policy is also retaliation for when someone may come forward with a complaint we also want to be sure that we're an agency or an organization that protects those who come forward with some sort of complaint, whether it's uh, for coworkers, supervisors, or elected officials. Um, no one can be retaliated, which could be look for uh, discharge, a demotion, a reduction in pay, a reassignment of job duties, um, and, and there is a, several items in this list of what could be uh, construed as retaliation. Uh, this policy is for all covered individuals, which again is um, employ employees, volunteers, members of the public, and elected officials. Uh, let's see, I wanted to make sure that, uh, that as elected officials and as all employees that you are aware that if someone comes to you with a complaint, it is your responsibility to bring that complaint forward to the appropriate persons, whether that is uh, someone, again, on the, on the council or a department head or to the city administrator or the city attorney. We do have a process for, for uh, handling uh, complaints that could come forward. We ask that employees uh, the council members use the chain of command so that you are going to the person uh, directly responsible for the incident. If that is uh, if that is comfortable, and if, if it is not comfortable, there are uh, avenues to go outside of the organization, which would either be through the State of Wisconsin Equal Rights Division or the EEOC, uh, and there are phone numbers provided in this policy as well so that people can do that. Um, and... The policy includes definitions of what uh, harassment, again, what nonverbal harassment could look like, other forms of harassment and physical, or and again, discrimination and retaliation. Um, the purpose is to provide a safe working environment for all and so that all feel safe as they can perform their duties. So um, that's all I have if anyone has questions. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much, Vicki. Next, we'll move on to the 2017-2021 uh, strategic plan action items. Daryl? I have uh, too much paperwork. Um, the uh, city strategic plan, uh, as you know, is a, is a five-year document and is part of the original uh, 
review uh, by you as council, uh, by you as a body, uh, common council body. Uh, we identified uh, the first two years, 2000, I think it was 17 and 18, uh, for uh, with specific action items as well as critical measures to, in order to measure success. Uh, so after that first, prior to the end of that first two years, uh, the Common Council also created 2019, 2020 action items and associated critical measures as we uh, come closer to uh, that fifth year, 2021, uh, city staff is beginning to work on uh, those action items and, and critical measures. Uh, so in your packet are a draft. Uh, there's, I expect there to be further refinements. Uh, please note that substantially they're similar to the first four years. Uh, there are sprinkled throughout this uh, latest document, 2021 action items, several items that are included in the five-year CIP for 2021. Um, but again, this is, uh, this is something that uh, both management team and U.S. Council members, if there's items, uh, whether it's a policy, uh, procedures, uh, capital items, um, you know, please bring those forward for, for discussion. Uh, these will go through a committee process uh, similar to the ultimate review uh, of, a, of a strategic plan and then ultimately back to you as, as a council. So over the course of the next uh, month, uh, you'll see this another time or two. Uh, but again, uh, I wanted to give you an opportunity to see what this document looked like. And again, uh, reiterate, uh, we welcome your input. Uh, so please forward them to either myself or to Claudius Stanskis. Uh, and we will uh, place them on for your further review and, and consideration. Any questions for Daryl? Okay, thank you. Next, we'll go on to the 2022. Mike? I'm sorry. Go ahead, Barb. Uh, Daryl, how much is COVID-19 going to impact the strategic plan in the next couple of years? Uh, again, with this being 2021 is the focus uh, of my recent comments. Um, probably too soon to tell um, based upon uh, how hard it hits uh, the U.S. as well as, uh, you know, possible medical breakthroughs as far as uh, vaccines. I think we've all heard the possibility that there may be a second wave uh, that may hit in the fall and maybe continue into the next year. So uh, it, at this point, um, uh, I haven't uh, uh, overwhelmed this document uh, at this point in time with COVID-19 related uh, action items or critical measures, but that's something I guess we could discuss further. Any other questions? Okay, next we'll move on to the 2022-2026 Strategic Plan Engagement and Council Survey. Chad Pelichek? Yeah, as Chad passes out uh, two documents, one is a summary of the survey uh, that you as well as the management team uh, participated in uh, over the last couple business days. But also I want to uh, extend my appreciation to Chad and Nancy Maring uh, for their work on developing a strategic plan engagement. Uh, as, as I just mentioned, our current uh, strategic plan runs through 2021, so we're in the process of identifying ways in which we want to entertain input, comments by the public, as well as elected officials and management team, as well as individual employees. And again, I think they've done a great job of, of providing a lot of detail as to how we're going to gain input. So the first document we're going to discuss is the one that's titled Strategic Plan Engagement. Those of you that are on the phone, I think this was included in your packet. Those of you that are here, I just handed out copies of. Um, and I would like to draw your attention to the first, the chart that's on the top of the, um, uh, the, the top to kind of outline where we're going. So stage one is to review the focus areas and the goals, and then I'll talk shortly about the results of the survey that a uh, number of you took last week. Um, but that's beginning now in May of 2020. We're looking to gather in community input and employee feedback in the June to July 
uh, time frame, and then we're going to complete an environmental scan document, and that talks a little bit more in detail on the second page of this handout as to what an environmental scan is. It's primarily a review of the Census Bureau data and trends as it relates to population and demographics. Um, so that will be completed between the May and August time frame. Actually, it's being worked on as we speak. Uh, stage two, the priorities and action steps. We're going to conduct a community employee uh, survey in the fall, sometime around September of 2020. Uh, two community workshops in October of 2020, and then a management team and a common council strategic plan workshop, similar to what we did in the last plan um, sometime in November. Uh, beginning in December of 2020, we, the management team and the common council re review a draft of the plan uh, with the goal of getting the plan to the council for approval in February of 2021 in time for the start of the capital improvements process and the 2022 budget process. So we've looked at ways of engaging with the public, particularly as it relates to virtually, um, and trying to minimize the impact of having people still doing this planning process but not having large groups meet for workshops. So we're looking at a number of opportunities. Uh, there's a number of tools out there online, Social Pinpoint, um, and then another one called Bang the Table, which is um, programs that allow you to do social interaction virtually. Um, so we'll be looking at how we can utilize some of those to minimize uh, direct impact of public hearings and workshops. The other thing we've done is we've uh, applied for a w, uh, AARP grant. Um, in the past, the AARP grant has funded bicycle repair stations um, and different projects. We've put in for a community engagement van um, where it would be a, a van that could go into neighborhoods and um, different public events and try to get people to engage with the city on our, our strategic plan focus areas. So should we get that funding? We've got a van lined up at the county that they're selling uh, for a reasonable price and we'll give it some goofy wild graphics and send it out into the neighborhoods and start encouraging people to uh, communicate more with us through this uh, tool. So the rest of the report that is before you talks in more detail what each one of those steps are. I'm not going to get into detail on it, but our goal is to really kick this thing off uh, full step and, and get to this uh, final approval sometime in the first uh, couple months of the new year 2021. The second document I'd like to review is the second one I handed out. And those of you that are on the phone, I just emailed this document out to all of you, as well as the department heads prior to the start of this. But uh, this is the results of the survey that the number of you took last week. So um, we had the survey was open for five days and administered via Survey Monkey. Um, Common Council management team members were invited to respond. We had 18 total responses. Um, the Common Council responses equated to seven, and the management team responses equated to 11. 16 respondents provided feedback on priorities for the next strategic plan. Nine respondents would like to be interviewed uh, to provide further insight. Um, and a full summary of the information gathered during the survey and the interview will be available after interviews have been completed. So in the chart, you can see that um, 100% all of the 18 responses agreed to the current strategic plan focus areas are being clearly defined, defined and well organized. 16% um, of you um, have additional priorities and goals that you would like to include in this next planning process. So some of the priorities and goals respondents identified as missing include support and foster owner occupied housing and neighborhoods purposeful strategic items to address diversity um, in the city, need to update the focus areas as needed to continue to change, and then include internal service departments when identifying priorities and goals. On the second page in the back of the document, um, the focus areas for the next strategic plan, almost 44.44% um, felt that they should be kept, 33% said they should be changed, and then uh, 22 percent change in some other way. So the ways that changes that they're looking for are um, to Alderman Feldy's comment, addressing the ec economic recovery after COVID-19, include diversity and inclusion, um, operational improvement, 
long range goal setting and then strategic planning process to be more public engagement. So we're hoping to address some of that. There's a long list of priority projects you all that took the survey were asked to rank your top three so you can see uh, the results of those and we will include those in the um, update and the further process as we go through, through this. So that's it in a nutshell. If there's any specific questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions for Chad? Mr. Mayor, may I go out of order and just jump into my next item? That'll be fine. Okay. Um, I handed out to the ones that are here in the uh, chambers as well as those that are on the phone. You should have received them in your doorstep today, but it's a folder, a blue folder that has a number of neighborhood resources. Um, for those of you that participated in um, last September's event at King Park, where we invited all the neighborhood association leaders in, this document was given out to them. Um, this is, and we heard from a number of you during that time that we should share this during the aldermatic training. So this is a document that talks about um, contact information for the, uh, the departments. The neighborhood association contact list is updated for all of the neighborhoods that are current, all the people that currently represent their neighborhoods um, and their contact information. There's a number of city speaking events, so if you're involved with any neighborhood associations and they would like to bring in a speaker, there's an opportunity to do so with that listing. Um, there's some documents on how to find your neighborhood officer, uh, request services from the city. Um, there's some marketing material on Nextdoor and how to get involved with that. Um, and then a number of programs that are done in support with the Department of Public Works. Uh, the adopt a park the neighborhood large item disposal program um, so that stuff is kind of outlined here with flyers as it relates to that um, some of the neighborhoods have taken advantage of what we like to say the hot dog request so we provide hot dogs for neighborhood events so that they can use them to draw people in uh, to different events and then there's some additional planning documents that we've been working with on our neighborhoods plan on a page um, to try to get the neighborhoods on board with a planning um, kind of laying out where they want to go, and then a mini grant program that we've had in the past. The other document that's in this um, for your review and, and thought is a map that shows the all of the neighbor all of the 70, 72 neighborhoods in the city overlaid with your represented districts for aldermatic districts. So you can see which ones make up your area uh, in in. Uh, reference to the neighborhoods for that area so you have that at your uh, fingertips so if there's any questions on this information I'd be happy to answer it but there's a lot of resources in there for uh, neighborhoods and for you as aldermen thank you Chad any questions appreciate your report uh, next we'll go on to constituent claims uh, attorney Adams Claims are an issue that sometimes gets uh, a lot of discussion. You may get contact from uh, some of your uh, constituents about it. Uh, and so just to make sure that you understand what the process is, uh, claims do need to be filed in writing with the uh, city clerk's office. And they do have a claim form uh, that we recommend using. Uh, they're not required to use that particular form, but it's really highly recommended because when people don't use the form, they tend to forget important or not be aware of important things that they have to include uh, with their claim. There is a, a staff committee uh, that includes a member of the finance department, a member of the city attorney's office, and a city administrator uh, that reviews the claims uh, and makes uh, recommendations to the city administrator on how to handle the claims. We do have a, a policy uh, that went into effect uh, in uh, 2017 uh, that basically authorizes the city administrator uh, to handle uh, and to make decisions on, uh, on claims uh, where the request of the claim is uh, up to $50,000. So that, that does cover uh, a large majority of the claims. So typically what will happen then is the claim will come in 
it will come to the Finance and Personnel Committee as a claim, so you'll see that it's there, but it's being handled internally and the process of uh, deciding whether to pay the claim and paying the claim is, is all handled, and it doesn't come back to the committee then uh, until it's ready to be reported on, which is what happened, you know, we'll report on what happened. We denied the claim or we paid the claim in, in such and such an amount or uh, we offered to, uh, you know, pay the claim, but they rejected, uh, rejected us. Um, in the rare situation where a claim is $50,000 or more, uh, then the committee does have to make those decisions uh, and, and it comes back to council then to, to, uh, to basically uh, ratify uh, the committee's decisions. Uh, as far as, as claims go, uh, we do uh, also keep in touch with our insurance carrier, SIPMIC. Uh, we have a process whereby they are made aware of uh, all the various types of claims, including uh, the claims that end up getting denied. Uh, so that they can kind of help us track and, and we track as well, are there problem areas? Are there areas where something needs to happen? It's also important to note that there are uh, certain kinds of claims that are fairly common for which there are procedures in place uh, where, uh, you know, they may not, if someone may not necessarily get paid out on their claim, but there are still procedures for dealing with the issue. So for an example, uh, when, when a snowplow uh, knocks over a mailbox, uh, there is a process in place that the Public Works Department has uh, for, for dealing with those things uh, and, uh, and, and you know, it, it's ready to go. So if you have questions about issues, it's probably, uh, when, it, when it relates to a claim, it's probably worth uh, following up uh, with my office uh, or with the finance department or the administrator uh, before, um, you know, bef before you sort of make any sort of promises about anything with regard to a claim. Because we do, we do this, the system is, is pretty, um, you know, we, we, it works pretty well. Um, and we kind of have a, a standard for how to handle a lot of those things. Uh, so that's really all I wanted to say on claims. I can answer any questions if you have any. Thank you, Chuck. Is there any questions? Very good. That'll conclude our orientation. Next item on the agenda is to adjourn. Alder Person Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to adjourn. Second. Thank you for that motion and support to adjourn. All those in favor of adjournment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. 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 We stand Bye. adjourned. Thank you very much.